Hi, my name is Bruce Dorn. and I'm one of the staff scientists at Science North and welcome to this presentation about the COVID-19 vaccine. So I will be one of your co-presenters and I'm going to bring in our other co-presenter. We'll bring in Alan. Hey, Alan. Hello, Bruce. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So Alan and I are going to be co-presenting this uh, this uh, presentation, obviously, about uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, I just want to give a kudos out to Heritage Canada because they were the ones that uh, helped sponsor this uh, free webinar so that everybody can learn about uh, COVID-19 and some of the, uh, uh, the information about COVID-19. And we're going to focus on uh, specifically on the uh, vaccines. Before we move on, uh, if anybody, any of the viewers wish to ask us questions, please write us in the Q&A section or in the chat uh, section. Uh, these will be relayed to us and then uh, Alan and I will do our best to answer uh, any questions that you may have about the vaccines and vaccinations that uh, are certainly uh, ongoing right now uh, to combat uh, this disease. All right, so we're going to start off with uh, the PowerPoint presentation. All right. So it's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to present some of this information to you. So what I'm going to be uh, going over with uh, all of you, we're going to have to start a little bit at the base, right? At the basic. In other words, you know, what are the what is the biology of our cells, right? Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about the coronavirus. I know a lot of you have heard enough about the coronavirus, but I need to talk about it a little bit to better understand how these vaccines work. And then very quickly about our immune system. This is a four-year course that I will be presenting in about 30 seconds, all right? So we're not going to go into too much detail, but just enough so you understand. A little bit about traditional vaccines. And then talk about these uh, COVID-19 vaccines, like the RNA vaccines, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the BioNTech. You know, how do these work? And then we have these DNA vaccines. Those are vaccines that you probably have heard, the AstraZeneca and the J&J, Johnson &J, Johnson uh, vaccine, and even Sputnik. The Sputnik one, that's also a DNA vaccine. Then we're gonna talk about another group of vaccines that use what we call viral subunits. I'll explain that in a few minutes. And then I wanna kind of highlight uh, just a couple of uh, vaccine candidates that are being developed here in Canada and that uh, I'm pretty proud of uh, uh, their development and how this may drastically change you know, the vaccination efforts uh, throughout the world. All right, so here we go. We're gonna start. I'm already seeing some questions, which is great. And uh, there, we're gonna start. We're gonna start with uh, the cell. So this is a diagram of a human cell. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I just wanna showcase some uh, major aspects of it. So a human cell, when you look at it, it's surrounded by a membrane, okay? So when you think of a human cell, it's just this sack of water with stuff inside that is surrounded by this membrane. This membrane is a lipid membrane. It's kind of like a fat membrane. It keeps the good stuff in, keeps the other stuff out, and it will determine what goes in and what goes out. All right. The other part of the cell I want to mention is the cytoplasm. That's the, the liquid interior that has all types of little organs called organelles. We got things like the mitochondria and Golgi apparatus. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but that's where you know a lot of the machinery of the cell is found. It's in this cytoplasm. It has a lot of these proteins, these little machines that work and do whatever they do in order for your cell to function. And the last one <clears throat> I wanna talk about is the nucleus, okay? And this is important because the nucleus is where you have your genetic material, okay? This is the material that you probably have heard, the uh, DNA, okay? The deoxyribonucleic acid. That is what codes for you, okay? That's your internal library that makes you, you, okay? And what's really interesting is that that DNA stays within the nucleus, okay? So I want you to think of a nucleus like a safe, and the DNA stays in there. It doesn't go out anywhere. But in order for your cells to function, pieces of this genetic information, that information has to somehow go to the cytoplasm for your cells to work well. So somehow there needs to be a way to transfer some of this information to go into cytoplasm. And what your body does, it transfers or it, it doesn't change, but it makes a copy of DNA into another molecule that we call RNA, ribonucleic acid. 
So I want you to think of the DNA like, let's say, books that are found in a locked library that's right here. And let's say you want a passage of that book. Well, you can't take it out. The library won't allow you to take it out. Well, what do you do? You make a photocopy of it. And that's what RNA is. It's like a photocopy. And that RNA can then get out of the nucleus and then will be used to make some proteins. Okay, those are the little machineries that are found inside your cells. And those proteins can stay within the cells, can go out. That's how it works, okay? So this is a very, very brief overview how uh, our cells work, okay? So why do I need to mention this? Well, we need to understand this to understand how the vaccines work. All right, the coronavirus. So here's a diagram of the coronavirus. So when you look at the coronavirus, it also has a membrane, this, this lipid fat globule that's right out there, okay? It is made up of not DNA, but it's made up of RNA. So, you know, a little bit different than the RNA that's found in our cells. But again, it's the genetic material. It's that stuff that the virus uses in order to make more viruses. And one other component I want to mention are these what we call spiked and spicules. And that's really important because these spikes allow the virus to attach to your cells to then go inside your cells in order to make more viral particles. So if you can somehow block that from happening, the virus can't replicate inside your uh, cells. So a virus such as a coronavirus is actually a very simple, I'll say life form, it's not really alive, but it has all the mechanisms in it in order to be able to get inside your cells to make, make more copies of itself, all right? One thing I just wanna mention, this membrane right here makes the coronavirus very susceptible to soaps. So just think of fat globules, let's say when you're washing dishes, right? And you add a bit of soap, those fat globules, you'll see it right away, they disappear, they break apart. Well, it's the same thing. So when you you know, use soap to wash your hands, you're gonna break that membrane right there and deactivate the coronavirus. So the coronavirus essentially cannot replicate, it can't do anything, it's essentially dead. It's like that. So you know what? Hand washing with soap is actually a very effective way of destroying coronavirus. All so, right. So Bruce, <clears throat> if I oh, need to go back. Yeah. No, uh, you're fine there. Um, in terms of the RNA, is <clears throat> is it accurate to say that the coronavirus is essentially rewriting the instruction manuals of your cells? No, it won't rewrite the instruction manuals of cells. And I'm going to explain what happens in a few minutes. But essentially what it does, it uses the mechanisms of your cells to make copies of itself. So this is actually a good segue to our next slide. I'm not going to go all the details of the slide. This is not the point. But you could. A really neat slide to show you how it works. But you could see the RNA comes out. And then the mechanisms of your cells will use the RNA to then make more viral particles. All right. So I want you to think of this RNA, okay, that goes into your cells and it kind of takes over some of the mechanisms of your cells to make more copies of the virus. It doesn't rewrite your cells. Your cells are still what they are, but it's going to take a portion of what your cells normally do to make viral particles. So I want you to think of this like, you know, a car plant, okay, a car manufacturing plant. OK, and you got, you know, the head engineer is telling everybody what needs to be done. So that's your nucleus with your DNA okay, telling you to build whatever car. And then the virus is the little bugger that comes in that brings some other instructions and goes right into the, your assembly line and is now telling the people at the assembly like, OK, now we're going to build bikes. And that's what's happening. So it's not really affecting your engineer. Your engineer is still there trying to control the cells, but then the little bugger, the virus is coming in and kind of midway telling your, your cells to make some bikes, all right? So it's not rewriting the DNA, it's just kind of taking over a certain section of the mechanisms of your cell. It's right? like biological industrial sabotage almost. Yeah. So Pretty much. It's, yeah, that's it's getting your cells to make viruses instead of making what they're supposed to be making. That's right. That's exactly what they do. All right. Now, that being said, there are some viruses that will go into your DNA and will rewrite your DNA. And unfortunately, some of these viruses are really bad and some of these viruses can cause cancers. So the HPV virus 
can actually cause cervical cancers in uh, some individuals. So there are some viruses that do this, but not COVID-19. It doesn't do it. It goes into your cells, makes copies of itself, and then spreads and infects more of your cells. All right. Okay. So let's look at the immune system. Oh my goodness, Bruce! Why are you doing this to me again? I just want to show this, this to high you. school biology all over again. Yeah. No, this is this is more. This is like four years of immunology. Again, I just want to show you very briefly how your immune system works, so you better understand how vaccines work. Okay, so again, I'm not gonna go in all the details right here. So we're gonna imagine this is a coronavirus, okay? And it goes into one of these cells, all right? It's called a phagocyte, don't worry about it. And what happens, your body will, will say, hey, this is something foreign. This is something that does not belong to me, okay? And a foreign molecule, a foreign particle that does not belong to you, there's a special term called an antigen, okay? So your body is going to say, hey, this is not normal. And then there's some cells in your immune system that will recognize this as something, hey, this doesn't belong to me. And then we'll stimulate the production of two or three types of cells. But we're going to start with these two types of cells. So we'll stimulate the production of what we call killer cells or call a cytotoxic T cells. And what they do, they go around. And if any of your cells are infected with the coronavirus, they're going to attach to it and cause those cells to die. Because that's the best way to get rid of a virus from the human body perspective. If there's no cell there, the virus can't really replicate, okay? So that's one branch of your immune system. The other branch, it will stimulate a bunch of cells called lymphatic cells, like B cells, okay? And when these B cells get stimulated, they'll transform into another cell called plasma cells, don't worry about it, but they produce these antibodies. We hear about antibodies a lot, right? The antibody counts and does it work and so on and so forth. And antibodies are kind of like a, a piece of protein. They're Y shaped, There's many different shapes, but these ones are Y shaped. And what they do, they'll bind right onto the virus and neutralize it. So they'll bind onto the virus all around and now the virus cannot infect your cells and will also be uh, eaten. Uh, by, you know, your immune system. And then one last branch I just kind of want to mention is that when this is happening, you got these killer cells being produced, you got these antibody producing cells that are produced, but then there's other cells called memory cells, okay? They're also produced and they just sit there, okay? And they sit there for years and years and years. And let's say 20 years down the road, let's say a coronavirus, the same type of coronavirus, reinfects your body these memory cells are going to be activated right away they're going to produce these plasma cells they're going to produce these killer cells right away they're going to transform into those and neutralize stop that virus right in into its track so essentially you don't get sick and that's the big aspect of your immune system it has a memory it will remember something it's been exposed in the past so that if it comes back it will stop it right away okay so very brief 101 about the immune system. Okay. I want to address a couple of questions and comments yeah. from the chat. Uh, Renata asks, what kind of cells will be co-opted to produce the spike proteins if you take the COVID-19 vaccine? Ah, okay. We're going to talk about that. But uh, frankly, the vaccines, okay, the, 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 the way it works, pretty much any cell can be infected. Well, we're not using going to infect it, but the vaccine could be use in order to make these the spike proteins i'm going to mention that in a few seconds how how it works so it's a little bit hard to for me to explain until i show you the process uh behind that all right there's also a comment from uh, eleanor mary who mm -hmm. says that uh, she has certain allergies and she's been told that the moderna vaccine has the least components to be allergic to am i correct in thinking that we will get to the different type of vaccines later in the presentation yeah i'm not going to go through really the components the individual components of every uh of every vaccine and some vaccines seem to uh, be a little bit better for people that have uh really severe allergies so my suggestion uh, to you is that if you have any questions any concerns uh, talk to your healthcare provider. They will be in a better position to tell you, especially for that particular individual, whether a vaccine is a little bit better uh, than, than another. That being said, <clears throat> we are uh, very impressed uh, how these vaccines are working. 
and how very few people are having, I'll say, severe allergic reactions to these vaccines. When I mean that is no anaphylactic shocks and things like that. Very, very few people. They do happen. And that's why, you know, when you end up having a vaccine, whether it's this one or, you know, a flu vaccine, they usually ask you to stay in a doctor's office for, you know, 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Because if you are going to have a severe reaction, it's going to happen right then and there. And it's a good thing that you're at the doctor's office because they have all the medication and equipment to, to treat that right away. So we're not seeing, uh, you know, people having these severe reactions and having, you know, the, these effects uh, as much, you know, because these, these vaccines have been tested quite a lot, have been tested in over 100,000 individuals so far. And now we're, we're, we're in the millions and millions of people uh, being immunized. That being said, there are people when they do get the vaccine, uh, they'll get a little bump. Some of them will be slightly feverish and not feeling too well. That usually lasts a few days. And essentially, I tell people, it's like, okay, as long as it's not a severe reaction, it's a good thing in a sense because it's actually telling you your vaccine is working. And it's not that the vaccine is making you sick. It's your immune system getting ready to fight the viral, a possible viral infection. And that's some of the side effect that you'll see with some individual. All right. So you know what? The vaccines that have been approved by Health Canada have been deemed uh, safe. So we do not have to worry about them. And uh, and as more vaccines are going to be approved, we're going to have uh, more choices and what kind of vaccines we can use in order to uh, uh, combat this disease. All right. And it's certainly safe to say that your odds with the vaccine is much better than your odds with the coronavirus. The odds are much, much better. So United States, I was just looking at data a couple a couple of weeks ago, you know, unfortunately, there's over 500,000 uh, 500, people in the United States that have died from coronavirus. And uh, the group that looks at the vaccines and side effects and vaccines, and they were also looking at the number of deaths caused by the vaccines, uh, the number of deaths in the United States, this was two weeks ago, caused by the vaccines is a big fat zero right now. So these vaccines definitely uh, work and they help to also protect you against especially severe side effects of the coronavirus, of this disease. Okay, so let's talk about vaccines. All right, how does a vaccine work? So we're gonna look at this a little bit in detail. All right, so a vaccine, essentially what it does, it injects, something foreign, like I said, an antigen, something that does not belong to your body into, you know, your body. And this will stimulate your immune system. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, you got three types of cells. There's a lot more cells. I'm just showing three types of cells. So you got the ones that produce the antibodies. You got the ones that will kill some of your cells that are infected with the virus. And you got cells that are called memory cells. Okay, so essentially the vaccine prepares your body in case again prepares your body in case you get really infected or a real virus goes inside of you. Okay, that being said, the vaccine only contains part of the virus, and the vaccine itself cannot make you sick. The COVID nineteen vaccine cannot give you COVID nineteen. Essentially, what the vaccines do, they prepare your body to fight an actual infection that would happen. Now, with the case of a vaccine, it takes a little bit of time for immune system to be stimulated, especially when you, you're injected the first time. So how long does it take? About two to four weeks. So you're hearing with some of these you know, double dose vaccines from, let's say, Pfizer and Moderna. Those are the ones that first came out. They would say you get your first shot and then you get your second shot after so many days, like 21 to 28 days. And the reason for that is they're going through this principle that, you know, your immune system is getting ready, so on and so forth. And then you get the booster shot after two to four weeks to get your body even more prepared against a viral infection. So that's why initially they said the two to four weeks. Now, the data has changed on that. And then you're hearing here in Canada, we're extending that almost four months. And the reason for that is when they look at the data that's currently being looked at for these vaccines, um, a lot of these scientists feel that you don't need to do it right away after the four weeks. You can extend it 
a bit later on. So I'm not saying it's the same principle. It's a bit of a principle, you know, when you get a shot when you are young and then you get a booster shot every 10, 20 years. Well, it's the same thing. It's just a way to reactivate your immune system. So that's why they've extended it because they, they, they found that the science said you don't necessarily have to wait two to four weeks. You can extend it a bit later. And in some cases, some vaccines even work better if you extend it. And the other reason why they're extending it is to be able to have enough vaccines initially to give everybody at least a first shot, that first initial, you know, uh, immunity, and then they'll give that second shot a little bit later. So it's a, it's a way of ensuring that everybody at least gets a first shot. But again, there's no danger in safety or anything like that. It will be effective. All right. Uh, we have a question from Julia. Yeah. Uh, how do we know we won't have side effects in the long run? Oh, that's a good question. Now, the way the way vaccines approval process happens is that I know it's usually, you know, there's a whole bunch of steps. There's a phase one, phase two, phase three that you test on, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals or tens of thousands of individuals, depending on the type of vaccines. And then before they are approved the vaccines, you know, by the time that the last phase is done and by the time that you can approve vaccines you have to wait a certain amount of periods four to six months if there's any side effects from these vaccines you would see it within that time period okay that's usually what it is so that's why when you we have these vaccines that have been approved they have followed these steps and there has been a delay between the last person being inoculated to a certain period of time to make sure you know we're not seeing these effects. That being said, you know what? I will have to agree. We do not know the long-term side effects of these uh, vaccines. So far, you know, we're in our vaccination process in about six months and we haven't seen anything. We're learning more and more about the vaccine. And that's part of the approval process is there's always a follow-up to see, you know, after two years and so on and so far, how these vaccines work and whether or not you know is there a long-term side effects that being said if there's you if there's any side effects on the vaccine like i mentioned they usually happen within the first four to six months when somebody gets a vaccine and right now we have not seen any major effects in that case all right so we are learning more and more about this, this these vaccines and we're learning more and more about these these viruses but so far, so good. These vaccines do work and they do protect people against the coronavirus. And I will just quickly echo what I said earlier, which is there's, it's biology. There's always going to be a slight risk, but you've got a much higher risk with the coronavirus than you do with the vaccine. That's it. That's it. Okay. So you got the vaccine. Okay, great. So lo and behold, you got a virus that goes into your system. You got a coronavirus. I don't know, months down the road after you got your vaccine, how does your body reactor. So it will recognize a part of the virus as being something that is foreign. That's the part that you will see with the vaccine. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So your immune system will recognize it. Nah, it's not supposed to be there. And right away, the plasma cells will release antibodies and the cytotoxic T cells will kill any cells that have been uh, infected. So let's say you get infected much later, a few months later, years later by the same virus. Again, your body will recognize this as something foreign. And what it will do, it will activate the memory cells that will activate the corresponding, you know, cells that will produce the antibodies and also the killer cells that will kill uh, any cells that have been infected by the virus. So that's the, the beauty about the immune system is that it will recognize something that it has seen or been exposed in the past and how it will react to it, especially the second, third or fourth time will be much faster than the first time. So the first time I said it takes two to four weeks for your body, you know, to build immunity. Well, this can be done in, the, in a matter of days. It's just like this. And a lot of times you won't even know you're sick because your immune system has controlled the infection before it has time to, to, to spread. All right. So that's the whole point of vaccine is to get your body prepared so that your immune system can react much quicker and much, much faster. Okay. All uh, right. We so, have a question uh, in yes. the chat. Are the spikes what the immune system usually recognizes? That's a good question. And I, I talk about the spikes a lot because that's what 
um, vaccine makers and researchers have been focusing on for the coronavirus. Okay, so that's what it is. But in a case of uh, other viruses or even the coronavirus, your your immune system might recognize certain components of the uh, of the membrane of the virus, might recognize certain components of the RNA or DNA of the virus, or other components. I don't. I didn't mention, but there's other proteins of the, the virus that it might recognize as being something foreign. So it's not necessarily just the spike molecules. It could be other molecules that are found on the virus that are foreign to your body, that your body will react to it, okay? But it's a good question because the vaccines that are currently being developed, we tend to focus more on the spike proteins because if you can neutralize those spike proteins, the virus can infect you. That's the way it is, all right? Uh, do you have time for some more questions? We could they're rolling in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll do one more. And then we'll keep uh, going. Okay. Uh, if you are on immune modulating medication, hmm. is there a preference to the vaccine you should get? Oh, good question. I have no idea. I have no idea <laughs> what would be a preference for, for that. Uh, well, you'll see that the vaccines tend to work in the in the same way. So my suggestion again, talk to your healthcare provider. Now, if you are an immuno uh, modulating uh, medication, or if you are slightly or severely immunocompromised, these vaccines may not work as well for you because you might not build an immune response as well as others. So that is why it's really important that all of us that can get vaccinated, get vaccinated as much as possible. If you can get about 70, 80, 90% of our population that gets vaccinated, that will decrease the chances of, let's say me, transmitting the disease to somebody who's immunocompromised and unfortunately they could get sick. So we can protect people that unfortunately can't get vaccinated or vaccines may not work uh, by vaccinating ourselves. Because if we can break that chain of transmission, then those individuals will be protected because we are vaccinated against the, the virus. Okay. So that's why it's important that a large portion of the population gets vaccinated. I know you said the only would be one question. I'm okay, going to okay. you and follow up with another one anyways. Uh, okay. this, is, this is related. If you have a comprised immune system or compromised immune system, is the vaccine less effective? Yeah, the, the vaccine will probably be less effective if you have a compromised immune system. So again, talk to your healthcare provider to determine whether or not it's worthwhile to have the vaccine and they will make that, that, that judgment call. And that's why, like I said, it's important that healthy individuals or individuals with a good immune system get vaccinated because they won't spread the disease to those individuals that unfortunately can't really protect themselves on their own. Uh, for those in the chat, I see the questions that are still there, and I'm aware of them. We're gonna we're gonna get through another slide, right, Bruce? And then we'll. Oh yeah, no problem. We're we'll definitely hit, closer up. Yeah, we'll try to hit some all the questions uh, in the end, but we'll try as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when we look at traditional vaccine approach, okay, essentially what they've done is they they've taken viruses and they've inactivated. They they kind of killed them, so they can't infect anybody or they, they take viruses that have been attenuated, weakened. So again, they can't really replicate inside of you, or they take in parts of the virus to expose to your immune system. That's the traditional vaccine approach. And it's work, it's work, you know, for, you know, decades, and it's protected us from a variety of uh, diseases. Now the new vaccines go with a slightly different approach. So I want to talk a bit about the RNA vaccines. These are the vaccines that you hear of from Moderna and Pfizer by and tech. All right. So the way they've done this, this is really ingenious. This is really ingenious. Okay. So what they did is they looked at the virus itself and they said, you know what? Let's try to attack the spike molecules, because if we can attack these spike molecules, the virus can infect your cells and therefore you neutralize, you stop the, the virus itself. So what they've done, is they figured out what piece of the genetic material of the virus, the RNA of the virus, that codes for the spike. They figured that out. And you know what? What's really interesting, they figured that out in March of last year. Because what happens, they knew the genetic code of the coronavirus. That was actually sh shared by uh, the Chinese uh, scientists, when the coronavirus came out, they actually did a, a sequence of that. They shared it to the world. And these vaccine makers looked at it and said, okay, that part of the code is the part of the code that codes for the spike protein. So he said, okay, well, that's good. So what do we do now? So what they do is they manufacture 
that code, okay, they, they don't use the actual virus and things like that. They manufacture it, it's synthesized and things like that. And next thing they do, they put it into a fat globule. So to give you an idea, I want you to think of salad dressing, you know, when you shake salad dressing, you see these little blob globules, right, of, of, of fat and things like that. Well, they put it in there, okay? And that is called a nanoparticle. So some of you have heard the term nanoparticles. Oh my goodness, is this this technology that will go inside my body and start controlling me with microchips? It's like, no, 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 no. It's a fat molecule. That's what it is, okay? It's a piece of fat. That's that's these nanomolecules. And they put it inside of it. So you're looking at me and say, okay, what's what's the point, Bruce? Where, where are we going with this? Well, here's where we're going with this. This is really ingenious. So here's the vaccine. The vaccine gets injected inside of you, okay? Your muscles. And then this is one of the cells, let's say muscle cells in your body. Well, what happens is that this fat globule here, okay, will fuse with your membrane. Fat and fat will come together, will fuse. And essentially what happens, it will release the piece of RNA inside your cells. And you're looking at that and saying, what? Okay, I just put a piece of viral RNA inside of you. Now, keep in mind that piece of RNA only codes for one thing. And what does it code for? The spike proteins. It doesn't code for the entire virus. You're not going to be producing more viral particles. Okay. And then some of these spike proteins are going to go outside the cell or be presented outside the cell to your immune system so that your immune system will build an immune response to that, you know, spike molecule. So what's so interesting with this is the traditional way of making vaccines, not all of them, but some of them, what you need to do, some of them, what you need to do, you would actually grow the virus inside, let's say a chicken egg or things like that. And then you have to deactivate the virus. You have to purify it. And then you have the vaccine that would inject inside of you. Well, what's neat with this is that your own cells are producing a viral component. Not the whole virus, just a part of the virus that your body will then use to build an immune response. So if we go back to your immune system right here, you get exposed to the coronavirus after getting that RNA vaccine, and that immune system will recognize that spike protein on an actual coronavirus and right away neutralize it, just like that. So what it has done, it has simplified the process in order to make the vaccine. And what I find super interesting, it's actually made the vaccines based on the efficiency rate really high. They're very effective in building an immune system response against the actual uh, virus. So that's how it works, all right? Now, some of you are gonna say, oh my goodness, I'm putting a piece of viral DNA inside of me. Is it gonna change my DNA? No. Will it produce viral particle, uh, part, particles? No. And then that's that RNA, you know, it's gonna stay inside your body all the time? No, actually the RNA will only stay inside your cells maximum 24 to 40 hours because RNA is so unstable, your body will just get rid of it. So it's just a quick way for your body to produce spike proteins so that you build an immune response uh, towards it, all right? So no need for chicken eggs. You don't need to actually grow the actual virus. You're only using a part of the virus so that your immune system can build a response towards it. So it's super, super neat. And because of that, there's some really good advantages of RNA vaccines. So <clears throat> your cells are producing. Like I said, you don't need chicken eggs. You don't need this complicated process in order to do that. Very easy to modify. So we're hearing now these variants that are coming out. Well, it's very easy to modify an RNA vaccine and, and these vaccine manufacturers have actually said it would only take them a couple of weeks to modify the vaccine and they would work against the, the variants. So, you know, they're very, uh, very quick to use. They use your cells in order to really build a very good immune response. Major disadvantage, RNA is very unstable, okay? And that's why when you look at the current ones, of Pfizer and Moderna, you need to you know, keep them at ultra low temperatures like in Pfizer or at least minus 20 in the case of Moderna. So that's why you know, it's, it's slightly disadvantaged right now using RNA technology. It's effective, 
but it's logistically very difficult to administer to, to, you know, most people around the world, I'm sorry, but to use this vaccine in some areas in the world where, you know, it's really warm and maybe much harder to administer, it may not be the vaccine of choice for uh, those countries and those individuals. All right. Do we have any uh, questions? Yes. Oh boy, do we. Uh, can we go back to the fat donut? Yeah, the fat donut. Let's go back to the fat Which donut. Which is all the donuts, really. particle. Oh, right. The fat donut. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do they have to match the fat of the cell membrane with the fat they use in the vaccine? They do. They do somewhat. They do somewhat. So the, the, the molecules that are here will bind or be somewhat similar to the one of the, the mermaid. It doesn't have to be 100%, but that's a good question. It would be similar to, to that. So components of what you would see here you would find in the uh, membrane of a human cell. Not all of it, but components of it, right? Because you see, you can have different types of fat and you see that, you know, when you, you, you're cleaning your dishes, you might have fat from, you know, a meat fat and then you got, you know, vegetable fat and you'll see kind of clumping together. It's a similar, uh, similar process. Uh, another question. Uh, somebody yep. says their aging mother is fearful of taking the vaccine as she has food allergies. Should she still get the vaccine? Yes. So she has food allergies. Uh, what she needs to do, again, talk to your healthcare provider. What has happened initially at the beginning when, especially the Pfizer vaccine came out, there were some people that reacted uh, to the Pfizer vaccine uh, quite strongly. And uh, I haven't heard too many other uh, instances of that happening. Was it really because of the vaccine? Was it because of other situations that, that happened? They're still trying to tease out of those effects. So if, if your mother has a food allergy and you're kind of concerned, talk to your healthcare provider and they will be able to, to give you the facts on which vaccines would work better for that individual compared to the other. Like I said, most people, when they do have a reaction, it's not usually a severe reaction. But please, Please tell, talk to your healthcare provider. Don't use that as, you know, a crutch not to get a vaccine. Because as Alan has said several times, the virus is a lot more dangerous than possible side effects that you might get from the, the vaccine. All right. And one, I'll give you one last question before we move on. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm kind of combining two questions here. <laughs> Uh, someone uh, asked about future birth defects caused by the vaccines. And there's someone oh. else is asking about pregnant women in general. Yeah, that's a good question. So they are now uh, testing on pregnant women. The thing is with this vaccine, because it uses RNA and doesn't really go inside your DNA, uh, biologically, there isn't a link. And therefore, we don't see, you know, this causing birth defects uh, for, for, you know, uh, expectant uh, mothers, the major issue why they, they haven't initially given it to pregnant women is because they hadn't tested whether or not it's effective for pregnant women. So that's why it wasn't initially, uh, some of these vaccines, uh, given to pregnant women because it was a group of individuals that they hadn't tested. They're testing more of it, but based on the biology of these vaccines, there's no fear of having birth defects with, with children. I know we're talking about, you know, genetic material transferring into your cells, but the way this works, uh, it would not affect the DNA of your cells. It won't rewrite the, the cells. It won't cause birth defects uh, uh, based on the biology of what I just uh, shown you. All right. So there, was, there was another question that was related to the, um, the food allergies one. So I'm going to yeah. have it here as well. What's the vaccine carrier fluid made of? And is that oh. what people with food allergies are reacting to? Yeah, so so some of that that carrier fluid, well, some of it is just salt and, and, and sugar, all right? So that's that's what it is. Uh, some of it are um, where people react are somewhat compounds that help uh, stabilize the, the RNA. And that could be what some people reacted to it. But like I mentioned before, it's a very, very low percentage of individuals that would have reacted to it. And we see that with other vaccines, whether it's an RNA vaccines or your, your flu vaccine. Some people react to some of the chemicals that help you know, stabilize that vaccine and in some cases help the vaccine work even more effectively. OK, and that's why, you know, talk to a healthcare provider. They will give you the facts 
And that's why after 15, 20, uh, after you get your, your shot, you wait 15 to 30 minutes to see if you have any reaction. But like I said, very, very few people have had severe reactions, even with these new vaccines, which is incredible. It really demonstrates the safety steps and protocols that we have in place, whether it is the, the companies that produce the vaccines and also with Health Canada approving these vaccines. And just to give you an idea, Health Canada approves all types of things, not just vaccines. And we have a um, Laurentian University professor that uh, was developing a, a kind of a hand washing solution at the beginning of the coronavirus uh, to be used for individuals. And he was telling me the steps and the, the process to get that vaccine, uh, not that vaccine, that, that material to be approved, it was just a type of soap, that's all it was, was very, very arduous, okay? And it was very arduous. And this was just a soap for crying out loud. So you could just imagine when it comes something that we inject inside a person's body, the process is even more arduous and more detailed to make sure that it's safe for individuals. All okay. right. And thank you for all the questions, everyone who is putting those in there. We really appreciate them. Yeah, it's really, really good. They're, they're really good questions. And keep yeah. them going. Like, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay, so now we talk about the RNA vaccines. I want to talk about the DNA vaccines. These are the vaccines uh, the AstraZeneca is producing, the vaccine that has now been approved by Health Canada, the, uh, the Johnson Johnson or the Janssen vaccine. And also a vaccine you probably have heard, the Sputnik vaccine, the, the Russian ones that now uh, more uh, Western countries are looking at and, 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 and seeing the, the, the efficacy and the safety of that. So in this case, it's the still the same principle. We are trying to figure out the piece of RNA that will code for the spike protein. But what they've done is they converted that RNA into a segment of DNA. Let's just say the difference between RNA and DNA, RNA has only one strand, and I, I think you could see this. This one has two strands, okay? I don't want to go much more detail, but they've done that. And that piece of DNA will code for the spike protein, okay? So you say, all right, that's, that's fine. Now, this is a little different. So they've taken that piece of DNA that codes for spike protein, and they, don't, they didn't put it in a fat donut like, like Alan just <laughs> mentioned. They did it a little different. They stuck it into an adenovirus, okay? They put it right into an adenovirus. And then you're thinking, oh my goodness, now we're injecting another virus inside of me and this is just like snowballing. Now, just one thing. This adenovirus that you, you see right there and the adenoviruses they use to, to actually make these vaccines have been used for 20 to 50 years, depending on, and actually are being used to uh, treat certain types of disease right now. The Zika virus uh, vaccine actually uses this adenovirus, okay? These are deactivated in the sense they don't have genetic semis in that that will make your, your body make more viruses. So they're safe, okay? They're not going to make you sick. And essentially, we're using the adenovirus as a way to carry the DNA to your cells. So the flat donuts that, you know, we were talking about, and adenovirus, I want you to think of them like the mailman or the mail carriers, okay? One of them is Canada Post and the other one's UPS, all right? They carry the genetic material that's inside, but they will not make you sick. They won't carry genetic material that will make more viruses. Now, I will say, and some of you have probably heard, some of these adenovirus are uh, from chimpanzees. These are chimpanzee and new virus. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, why would they use chimpanzee? It's because our human system have not been exposed to it. So they use that because then your body won't build in a strong immune response to these, okay? It's not something that we're already immunized and it works. It works really well, like helping to carry that DNA. So don't be afraid. This is not the beginning of the planet of the apes. We are safe, all right? That we're not creating more of these viruses. We're only using the virus as a carrier to bring this piece of DNA to your cells. All right, so here we go. You get the injection, you get the vaccine inside of you, again, the arm, all right, here's your DNA. The virus will bring the piece of DNA and goes into your nucleus. Now, right away, some people are gonna say, oh, it's gonna go into my DNA, it's gonna alter my DNA and things like that. Well, you know what? That was my first question I had, right? I was like, what is that? 
So I actually contacted the scientist from AstraZeneca and she explained to me that when that piece of DNA goes into your nucleus, it doesn't combine with your DNA. It doesn't alter your DNA. It just sits there, all right? And essentially what happens, your body will take that piece of DNA and make a little piece of RNA, a photocopy of it, which will then go into your cytoplasm. Oh, look at that. And then your body will produce spike proteins, just like that. And then those spike proteins will come out and your body will build an immune response to that, okay? So in some sense, it's, it's somewhat similar to the RNA vaccine. It's just adding one extra step. And I'll explain why they, they did that uh, in a couple of seconds. All right, so, all right, so what happens? You got this, it recognizes the immune system. So after the vaccine, the same thing happens. Your body will recognize that and will build an immune response to that. So I, I see a question right here. And I want to kind of address it. Yeah. Is it after you take that vaccine, right? And you're using the, the adenovirus to infect uh, your cells and things like that. Will the adenovirus no longer be useful to you? Will your body build an immune response to it? And that's, that's a good question. And they're still looking into this. And so far, no, it doesn't seem to build a very strong immune response to it. That being said, the Russians had a different way to build their vaccine. What they did is that the first shot you get has one type of adenovirus, and the second shot is a different type of adenovirus. So they thought about that. They thought about, oh, what happens if you build an immune response for one and you get the other? Could it no, neutralize and things like that? Well, they got around that problem completely. OK, but based on what we're seeing with the data with um, uh, Astra, AstraZeneca and even now, John Sonson, they're looking at doing a second shot. We're good so far. OK, and guess what? If that adenovirus, you know, we start using it in many applications and we're seeing that the human population has started to build immune response to adenovirus, well, they can use another one. They got a whole catalog of them and they could use another one and that could be a different you know, carrier for, for uh, this uh, piece of DNA, all right? So some of you are saying, well, why, why are we doing it this way? Why don't we just stick with the RNA? Okay, well, there's a couple of advantages using DNA. First of all, you know, again, you're using a cell to produce the spike protein, just like the RNA, but it is stable. DNA is stable. You can store it in the fridge. So that's the main advantage of the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson and the Sputnik one. You can just send it in a cooler to let's say a long-term care home to a pharmacist and then sticks it in their fridge you can just keep it you know at cool temperatures and they will last a lot longer than the rna that has to be kept in ultra cold temperatures the other thing also this technology like i mentioned is well established okay it's been around for 20 to 50 years depending on what you look at so it's a technology that has been used in the past that we know very very well and we know the process of building these vaccines uh, how to make sure that these vaccines are effective the disadvantage it's not as easy to modify as the rna it's easy to modify the dna segment but again you you, you have to put it into you know these these virus transporters that then can bring the, the DNA inside of you. So it's a bit more of a production process than the RNA, but to tell the truth, it's not that much different. So, you know, we talked about the RNA, you know, in a couple of weeks, they can have a vaccine. Well, maybe with this one, add an extra week or two, okay? So they, they can build these, these, uh, these uh, vaccines relatively easily. It takes a bit more time than the RNA one. All right, do we have any other questions? Not seeing any other questions. No, we had a uh, Janice said thank you. Which oh, I think okay. is also really? important to uh, relay. Yeah, <laughs> that's really good. Okay, so let's answer some misconceptions and misinformation about some genetic vaccines because I hear this. Okay, I hear this, especially with certain groups of individuals that you know are not promoting vaccination. They're they're kind of doing the opposite. The first thing they say they can verify your DNA, and I just mentioned that not at all. The RNA one stays in your cytoplasm and only lasts about 24 to 48 hours. It doesn't go into the nucleus. Whereas the DNA one does not combine with the DNA of your cells and therefore cannot really modify your cells. Now, some of you have said is that, well, okay, it's inside your cells. 
Is it going to stay inside your cell forever? Well, until the cell dies. Okay. Once the cell dies, well, that piece of DNA is gone. And it's all, you know what? We're constantly changing cells. Cells are dying and, and being reborn and, and changed. So, you know, you get jabbed into the muscles, but a lot of these muscle cells are not going to be there permanently, right? You're, you're breaking down muscle cells. You're building new muscle cells. So, you know, the cell, went, or the lifetime of that cell is when that piece of DNA will stay. But again, it won't modify the genetics of that cell. And once that cell dies, it's gone. It's gone forever. Okay. So these are temporary pieces of genetic material that go inside your cells to produce those spike proteins, but they will disappear. Okay. They don't stay inside you. And more importantly, they don't change your DNA. They don't change your genetic information. Okay. These vaccines can create viruses. No, because you're only taking a small part of the virus to produce the spike proteins. You don't have the entire genetic information. You don't have the entire uh, information to produce the viruses. So you don't have to be afraid. And that's why these vaccines cannot create and cannot give you COVID-19 because they don't have all the information that the virus needs in order to make that disease or uh, to create uh, that virus. Okay. So they are very you know, good and effective virus to really build up your immune response. And now I will tell you when, when, when they were working on this and they've been working on these genetic uh, vaccines or, you know, vir uh, vaccines for, you know, decades, we did not know in the scientific community how effective they were going to be. And to see the levels of effectiveness, I was hoping it was going to be around, you know, 60%. And to see such high levels of, of, of effectiveness and, and really seeing really little side effects with that, we were pleasantly surprised. And that that's really what science is all about. You know, we tested and tested and tested, tested on, you know, animals, we tested on, you know, tens of thousands of individuals. And then when we saw it was really good and effective and safe, that's how, that's when it was rolled out to the general public. So I'm really, really happy how this has evolved as a vaccine. Well, you just answered one question, I believe, which is, are there any other genetic, uh, genetic vaccines that came up before COVID-19. You just said they've been working on them for decades. Yeah. So I, I believe that answered that question. And then there's another question about when will the Johnson & Johnson vaccine be available? <laughs> Good question. Uh, don't know. The federal government uh, is still trying to get word from John, Johnson & Johnson about uh, when those vaccines are going to be available. There's been production delays. And also the fact is, is everybody's clamoring for, for vaccines. So good question. I don't know. I don't know. You're going to have to keep keep up on the news, see what what the procurement officer is going to say. I have no idea. Okay. They've been approved in Canada, I believe, that vaccine. Yeah, I think at the beginning of March, it, was, it was approved. It just hasn't. It's not distributed yet. It's not distributed. Right. Not yet. OK, I want to talk about a vaccine that uh, made the news, especially a month ago, the Nova Vax vaccine. And why am I mentioning this is this is the uh, company that the Canadian government got a uh, kind of a, an understanding with them that they would actually produce here in Canada. Now they're looking at late summer, beginning of fall in order to produce this vaccine. So this is not, you know, one that we're going to get right away. And again, it needs to be proved that this vaccine is effective. So I just want to mention how this vaccine, the Novavax vaccine works so that, you know, when you hear a bit about it, uh, you'll have a better understanding how it works. So this one's a little bit different. OK, what they are doing. OK, they're taking, again, a piece of RNA of the vaccine they're making it into a DNA to produce the spike proteins. OK, but they're doing it in a little different way. OK, they take that piece of DNA and they stick it inside a virus called baclovirus, okay? And then they use those baclovirus to infect cells of fall army word, uh, army word moth. And you might say, what? Why would they use that? It's, a, it's a, a group of cells, okay? It's a cell line that has been used in research for years and years and years to build vaccines, okay? And they, they've used them for different types of vaccines and they've been using this in order to produce the spike molecule, okay? So instead of taking that piece of RNA and DNA and putting it inside your cell and your cells are producing the spike molecule, they're making the spike molecules themselves, okay? But here's a twist. 
they take that spike molecule and instead of just having spike molecules floating into a vaccine that goes into your arm, they attach it into a nanotube. Again, it's a tube made of, I'm not quite sure what material, again, nothing dangerous. So it kind of looks like this. It's got these, you know, spike proteins taking up where the nano uh, tube is. And the reason for that is that your immune system will react much stronger when you combine the spike protein with this nanotube, all right? So that's fantastic. That's something that, you know, would work. So instead of having that piece of RNA or DNA go inside your body and our body produce the spike molecules, these nanotubes with the spike molecules are injected into our body and that will promote an immune response. Now, one thing I get really excited about this technology is because the CEO of the company, who's a, a scientist, say, you know what? What we could potentially do, we can have different types of variants of spike proteins on each nanotube. So for example, so we got the original coronavirus, and then you can add the variant that came from you know, one section of the world, another variant that came from another section of the world, and things like that. So therefore, that vaccine could potentially immunize against the original strain and also a number of variants of that strain. So you would only need one shot for that. So that's where we get really excited about it in science because now we're, we're kind of innovating. We're trying to figure out ways in making you know, the immune response respond stronger and maybe to more variants. So you know what? Again, the same thing happens after injection, after the infection, your body will recognize that, vac uh, that virus is something foreign and will build an immune response towards it. So again, the advantages of this Novavax uh, vaccine is that it is stable. You could store it in the fridge, which is great. Uh, the technology is actually well established. Like I said, they've used this for other uh, vaccines and you could potentially produce one vaccine for several variants. That, that is the power of this type of vaccine. The disadvantage, again, it's a little bit more difficult processing than the other genetic vaccines. But, you know, if you don't have to make, you know, we got what, four or five variants right now of concern. Instead of having to make four or five different vaccines, you just make one encompasses all that you could just imagine a major advantage of this type of vaccine we have a question in the in the chat about how do they make the nanotubes and based on what you just said it sounds like slowly yeah i'm not sure how they make the nanotubes that's a good question I'm not quite sure how they make those those nanotubes why why the process is a bit slower it's not necessarily the nanotubes from what i understand it's the army worm cells producing the spike proteins and then you have to purify that extract to then put it into the nanotubes. So it's an extra step there. So that's why it takes a little bit uh, longer. But how to produce those nanotubes, I'm not quite sure. And they can produce them ahead of time, right? They don't have to wait until you know the spike proteins are there. So I don't think that's the rate determining step. I think it's the fact that you have to allow cells to produce these uh, spike proteins. All right, good question, good question. All right, so I wanna talk about two key candidates, okay? And you've heard about them in the news, so I wanna go through them just briefly. Again, none of these key candidates have been approved. Uh, one of them, uh, I think the next one, I think is in phase two, three, and the first one, the last one's still in phase one. So they have not been approved by HalCan. When you say phase two, three, how many phases are there? So there's three phases for humans. So the first phase or the first test they do is preclinical. They do it on animals. They do animal testing, make sure it's safe, right? And it is effective. If they're not producing any uh, immune system response, forget it, they're not doing it. And obviously you want it to be safe. Phase one, you do it on tens of individuals, healthy individuals. So you inject them, you're looking for side effects and you're seeing whether or not they build immune response. So that's phase one. Phase two, you're injecting it in uh, hundreds to maybe a couple thousand individuals of different uh, age group, well, not age group, sex, uh, ethnicities, health levels. And at that point, you're still looking for side effects. You're still looking if it's safe. You're still looking if it's effective, but you're trying to find the right dosage that it's most effective. And then the phase three is the most critical one. It's also quite critical. Then you do it on tens of thousands of individuals. 
And this is where to see whether or not you have a really good effectiveness. Again, they're still looking at side effects and, and things like that. So those are the phases that they do with testing on, on humans, phase one, phase two, phase three, and they got a preclinical. All that data needs to be sent to Health Canada. They review that data to see if there's anything unusual and whether or not the vaccine is effective. In addition to that, Health Canada will then visit the vaccine production sites to make sure that they meet certain quality standards. So whether or not the equipment is good, whether or not the personnel is trained and so far and so forth. So it's a very arduous process. Now, normally with normal vaccines, the procedure is the, the vaccine producers will go clinical one, the animal testing, then all the human testing. And if, if it's good, it's good. They send all that information to Health Canada, Health Canada will review it, then they'll go to the manufacturing plant, they're going to review it, and then everything's hunky-dory. So going through all these steps normally can take five to 10 years, depending on the vaccine. These COVID-19 vaccines were, were approved uh, a bit quicker because the process was fast-tracked. So when you know they had data with the, the clinic, not the clinical trial, the preclinical trial on animals, what these companies did is they sent that data directly to Health Canada. And then phase one, they sent the information right away. They didn't wait till the end of the testing. They would send information to Health Canada as it came upon, when they came upon it. Also, Health Canada then visited, even before the clinical trials were done, would visit the manufacturing plants, you know, just as they were finished building, and they would go through the process and things like that. So the approval process still went through the same steps, but what they've done, they kind of fast-tracked it, okay? Instead of waiting at the end to get all that data and then approving it, they got the data as the data came in. So they were kind of looking at stuff so that the approval process, instead of taking an extra year after the end of the final you know, testing on humans, it would happen just months afterwards. So that's why the approval process with these COVID-19 vaccines appears a little bit quicker. And yes, because they kind of made it a bit more efficient the way they've done it. They kind of fast-tracked the process. But let me tell you, they did not cut any corners. They did the same process as any other vaccines. It's just it's just done uh, in a way that's much more efficient, in a way that Health Canada can get the information quicker and be able to approve it in such a way that, you know, we got vaccines uh, under a year after the, the whole uh, trial process started, which is it's just amazing. OK, so approval process is still the same. It's just done uh, in a way that was more efficient. All right. How often does Health Canada reject a vaccine candidate? That's a good question. I'm not sure about that, but let's just say that on average, you know, when you're looking at drugs and vaccines being done, you know, by the time they go through all the steps and even a lot of them fail, even after the clinical phase one, phase two, things like that, only a small percentage. And I think, don't quote me on this, it's less than 10%. Okay. So you could just imagine you got all these things happening. So, you know, you got less than 10% that actually goes to Health Canada. And I'm not sure how many uh, get rejected. And I'm pretty sure the companies, when they, they, they go through this process, they know what Health Canada does. So they're not sending them stuff that, you know, wouldn't meet with Health Canada uh, standards. So it's a good question. I'm not quite sure how many times that, that Health Canada would not approve a certain candidate. Okay, so I want to talk about Mid Chicago. This is a company uh, from Quebec, and what they've done is that they're producing these viral subunits. Okay, so we saw with um, Novavax that they use these moth army worm cells to produce this. Well, in this case, they're actually using a cousin of a tobacco plant to do that, using plants in order to produce a vaccine. And this is really novel. This is amazing. Uh, the technology they've done. So essentially, they've taken the, the piece of RNA of the, of the virus that goes through the, the spike proteins, they made it into a DNA, they put it into a bacteria, not sure what bacteria it is, proprietary, right? They don't want to tell you. But that bacteria will then put that piece of DNA inside the plant, and then the plant will produce the spike proteins. But what's really interesting, it just doesn't produce the spike proteins it produced what is called a virus-like particle. So here's a, an image of what they produce, okay? It's an electron um, image, electron microscope image, okay? It looks like, 
And this is what the coronavirus looks like. So in other words, they're producing a particle that has these spike proteins sticking out that looks similar to a coronavirus. And the idea is because not only does it have these spike molecules sticking out and also it looks similar to the coronavirus, they're hoping this type of vaccine will induce a strong immune system response in individuals, which is fantastic. So it's a different way of producing a vaccine. And frankly, in order to produce a vaccine, you just need a greenhouse. That's all it is. You produce a greenhouse, you crush the plants, extract the virus-like particles. You have to obviously purify it, and then you can use that as a vaccine, which is just fantastic. Uh, where are they at at this point? Like I said, during phase two and three, uh, I'm not sure at what point they, they are. Uh, are we going to see this vaccine in Canada and like anytime soon? I don't know. Maybe at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Okay. But they were, this is a technology they've been working on. They were using this technology to develop a new type of flu vaccine and they kind of pivoted in order to use this technology for the coronavirus. So you've heard this, this company, and that's how they produce uh, this type of vaccine. Another company I kind of want to mention, so I'm a, a company in the West Coast called Simvivo. All right. So we learned that you can take the viral RNA to make a piece of DNA and you can stick it in your cells and your cells will produce the spike proteins. We, we saw that earlier. Well, they did it a little bit different. Okay. Don't worry about all the, all the text. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go through just the important part. What they've done is they've taken that piece of DNA and they stuck it on another piece of DNA that's round. It's called a plasmid. Don't worry about it. Okay. And essentially it goes into a bacterium. They stuck it into a bacteria. And you're thinking, oh my God, Bruce, where, where are we going with this? Well, I don't know if you recognize, but this bacteria is called a bifidobacteria. And some of you might say, hey, wait a minute, I've heard about this. Bifidobacterium is a bacterium that you use <laughs> in probiotics and also in yogurt. That's what they use to make yogurt. So they're using bacteria in probiotics and in yogurt making. And you're thinking, what are they doing? And instead, instead of injecting it into your arm, what you would do is you would ingest it, and then the bacteria will take that piece of DNA, stick it in your cells, so that your cells will produce the spike proteins. Hmm, that's novel, right? We, we showed you, you know, the donut fat that would transport the DNA. We showed you the adenovirus that would transport the DNA. This one is a bacteria that does that, all right? And this technology is in such a way that we can you know, insert the spike gene inside and other genes of the virus so that your body builds a stronger immune system response, okay? Again, I'm not gonna go into all details with it, but the thick, big thing I'm really, 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 really excited about this, okay? It's a different technology, but what I'm really excited about this is here. I want you to look at this orally. In other words, no injections, you would just take a pill and that's it. That's your vaccine. This is a game changer, right? You could potentially give this to pharmacists around the world, pills. They could put it on their shelf. And if somebody wants a vaccine, you give them a pill and that's it. And that is like the golden goose, right? When we talk about vaccines, because you don't need refrigeration. You don't need needles. It's an oral pill that you would use in a vaccine. So you could just imagine in countries where refrigeration is more difficult, in countries where you know a vaccination effort with syringes may be more difficult, in countries where they may not have as many healthcare providers, this is a way to ensure that you know people around the world can get a vaccine for this uh, disease. So it's just ama it's amazing how you know they're using different technologies in order to you know, stimulate your immune system to protect itself, uh, to protect your body against the virus. So if there's one thing I could say that's good with this pandemic, it's really helped spark you know, vaccine innovation. Because a lot of times when we look at you know, vaccine development and things like that, a lot of times what happens, many, many vaccines don't get developed because it takes millions and billions of dollars to do this, right? And a lot of, you know, companies, they're, they're, they're private, 
And you know, their stakeholders may not want to put that money into it, into that development and technology that may not work. With this pandemic, you know what? Governments were giving money left and right to spark this innovation, to figure out different ways in order to produce these vaccines, to have as many different types of vaccines possible, at least one of them, hopefully, that would be effective against COVID-19. And as a result, I think we kind of opened the door on how vaccines are going to be built, distributed, made in the future. And this is kind of a revolution. It's a revolution on how you know we are going to be building vaccines, not just for COVID-19, but in the future, and the different types of technologies that is actually out there to combat a certain type of disease. I, in my knowledge, I do not know of any disease that you know that's out there that we've built so many different ways in order to produce a vaccine to combat it and that's just that's just innovation that's just innovation there was a need for it and we built these different vaccines and different technologies that would have probably just sat there for decades and decades and now been accelerated and then we're going to be seeing it in the arms or the intestines of individuals uh, within the next couple of years. So it's just fantastic. We we're thinking, you know, uh, using these technologies for certain types of diseases that we're having trouble to treat, like HIV, you know, the one that causes AIDS. And we're using some of that technology to treat dengue fever. You know, it is a major thing. And now we're looking at using this, these technologies to treat another disease that affects a major portion of the world, malaria. So it's just amazing that, you know, there's different ways to produce vaccines in order to stimulate your immune system. And this pandemic has really ramped up our efforts uh, in innovation in that case. All right. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? I I'm just going to come Don't back see back. any questions. Uh, I'm getting hungry because you're talking about yogurt and donuts. <laughs> so more of a comment, I guess. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's good to see that Canada is, is right involved and in, even some, in some ways leading the way on this vaccine research. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Canada did put a lot of money, several million dollars out there for, for for vaccine research to get these different vaccines going, yeah. And if we didn't have this pandemic, these researchers wouldn't have had this money. Now, I think I'm just gonna finish off by just one last thing, you know, we're, we're hearing about, you know, th these different vaccines being approved by Health Canada, and they get a lot of comments or people saying, you know, which one should I use? And, and, and I'm hearing efficacy, efficacy rates of one being better than the other and things like that. So the messaging is, you know, if a vaccine becomes available to you and you can have a vaccine, use it. Doesn't matter if it's from one company or the other. Doesn't matter if it's an RNA vaccine. Doesn't matter if it's a DNA vaccine. Doesn't matter if it's a subunit vaccine, if they get approved by, by Health Canada. Health Canada approved these vaccines because they are safe and they are effective. Now you're seeing numbers, right? A lot of numbers right there. I will tell right there, don't worry about the numbers as such. All these vaccines, these numbers, they all work the same way. All these vaccines that when people get, okay, all of them prevent individuals from getting really, really sick from COVID-19. So if you happen to be one of those unlucky individuals, you get a vaccine and your immune system hasn't really been so strong and build a strong immune response, and you do get COVID-19, you will not end up at the hospital, okay? And you will recover very well. And that's all the vaccines, okay? Whether effect, efficacy rates in the 60s or in the 90s, they all work that way, okay? And they're now looking, there's more research saying that these vaccines are actually very, very effective at preventing the spread of the virus from one individual to the other. So that's the other thing that you need to keep in mind that not only are you vaccinating yourself, you know, to protect yourself so you don't end up at the hospital and being really, really sick, but also protecting others so that you don't end up spreading the virus to, to everyone. So please do not hesitate, you know, when it is your turn to get a vaccine, get the vaccine, follow the protocols that tell you some vaccines are two shots, the Johnson Johnson is one shot, we'll follow the protocols, but please get it because the quicker we can get vaccinated, the quicker we can return to whatever new normal it's going to be. I'm an introvert and even I want to start going outside again. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm really looking, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the vaccines getting out and being spread around more and be more available so that, yeah, 
we can be done with this whole thing as fast as possible. Yeah. Which is still going to take a while, but. Yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind, you know, we still follow the protocol. So even though you may have had the vaccine, you know, follow the protocols of mask wearing, also you wash your hands, the number of people are there. The protocols are going to change. They're going to change as more and more vaccines are going to be distributed to, to people. Uh, but a lot of experts are saying that this summer coming up will be a lot better than the previous summer. And that's if everybody gets the vaccine. All right. So hopefully this helped to answer some of your questions that you may have had about the vaccines, uh, just to give you a kind of clarity of what it is. And I'll just finish off one last thing. If you have any questions about the vaccines, if you have any hesitation about the vaccines, talk to your healthcare provider. Okay. They are the best source of information to tell you, you know, all these things about the vaccines. All right. So thank you very much to have joined us uh, with this uh, presentation. And uh, you know what? Once you get it, please get vaccinated. The quicker we get vaccinated, the quicker we could come back to a new normal. Bye. Thanks, Bruce.